Hey there, everybody. It's Dr. Sean Tassone, America's holistic gynecologist, author of the Hormone Balance Bible, and practicing GYN, integrative medicine, in Austin, Texas, Round Rock, Texas. I'm licensed in about 36 states, so for any of you that um, may be needing help because you can't get people to listen to you, you can't get doctors to help you, I'm more than happy to help. And I'm on Instagram at Sean Tassone, MD. I have a YouTube page where all these podcasts go. Um, and I also just wanted to put out there that for those of you that want to go deeper, for those of you that want more information and you like the way that I do things, because um, obviously if you can't stand me, then this probably wouldn't work for you. But I do have a membership that's called The Hormone Project. And you can see it at thehormoneproject.com. If you go there, you'll see all the things that you get with the membership. It's a monthly fee, um, live interviews with me, Q&As with me live that will be banked so you can see those. I've got hours and hours of recorded videos that I've done just recently to keep you updated on all the happenings in the hormone world. We're going to teach you how to read studies. I'm going to teach you how to talk to doctors and ask for the right tests that you want. So if you're interested in that, head on over to thehormoneproject.com. Something I wanted to talk about today, and I get this question a lot, and I think that there's a lot of fear, misunderstanding, misrepresentation, um, and really just not a lot of understanding about uh, bioidentical hormones and compounding. And I think people get confused between the difference when they say, because I have a lot of women that will ask me on Saturdays, they'll say, um, are bioidentical hormones the same as compounded hormones? Or uh, what's the difference? And so here's the thing. When you go get a prescription for a patch or an estradiol cream or an estradiol pill, you go to the pharmacy, CVS, Walgreens, Costco, those are bioidentical, meaning they look like the hormones that are usually circulating in your bloodstream. Micronized progesterone, same thing. Um, the other hormones that are available like Premarin or the progestins that are in birth control pills or the ethanol estradiol that is in uh, birth control pills, those are synthetic in the sense that they are manufactured, but they don't look the same. Now, all these hormones are technically manufactured. You have to make them. Um, so let's get past the whole concept that, well, they're more natural. They're not natural in the sense that they just occur in nature. They come from, the bioidentical hormones come from wild jam, cactus, and soy. But they have to be made in a lab. If you rub wild yam or cactus or soy on your skin, it's not like it's going to turn into a hormone because your body can't do that. So they make it in a lab. They make it to look the, the way that they do, and then they sell it to Pfizer or whoever makes the hormones patches. That's but they can also sell the powder to compounding pharmacies. So bioidentical hormones just means the way that the hormone looks structurally. Does it look very similar or exact to the hormone that you normally had circulating in your body, or did they have to alter the chemical structure? And the reason for that, you can't trademark or um, market a bioidentical hormone because they are naturally made. So therefore, there's no money to be made on bioidentical hormones. So what they have to do, like let's take, for instance, Prometrium, which is the first bioidentical hormone really, other than estradiol, that was available on the, on the open market. The way that they got around the trademarking was that they suspended it in peanut oil. So they couldn't trademark the progesterone, the, pro, the, the, the micronized progesterone, but they could, they could um, trademark the delivery system, the peanut oil. And that's what they did. So it's not the hormone. And it's the same thing when you hear things like, these aren't hormones, but when you hear like semaglutide or terzepatide, um, those medications are peptides that naturally occur. What they did was they FDA approved and trademarked the dosage, meaning 2.5 milligrams, and the pen that gives you the injection. But they can't trademark the semaglutide or terzepatide because they're naturally occurring peptides. So 
for some, it's a money game because these companies, you know, look, pharmaceutical companies have to pay millions upon millions of dollars in research and development to get a medication FDA approved. And they want to capture that on the back end. So usually their trademark lasts about seven to 10 years, and then they can come out with a uh, generic. So here's the thing. Bioidentical hormones look structurally similar to the hormone that was naturally in your body. You can get those at Walgreens. You can get those at Walmart, CVS, wherever. Estradiol patches, estradiol creams, estradiol um, oral capsules, micronized progesterone, those are all available. There is no um, FDA-approved testosterone prescription for women that you can get at a regular pharmacy. All these hormones, estradiol, micronized progesterone, micronized testosterone, they are all FDA approved. All these hormones are FDA approved. What's not FDA approved is the actual compounding pharmacy where it's made. So when you hear somebody say to you, those hormones aren't FDA approved, well, they are. They're just the compounding pharmacy where they're made. And that's going to lead me into compounding hormones versus um, mainstream hormones. So they're both bioidentical. Like I said, you can get bioidentical hormones, Walgreens. CVS. But I tend to use compounding pharmacies to make them into doses that I want them in. Um, with a compounded medication, I can also put everything into one prescription. So if I wanted to put someone on estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, I could put those all into the same cream and it's almost the same price versus somebody having to buy four separate prescriptions. So that's at a compounding pharmacy. So what is a compounding pharmacy and why do I feel like they're necessary? Well, compounding is the creation of is the creation of a pharmaceutical preparation by a licensed pharmacist. So these pharmacists that make these are licensed by your state. They're made to meet the individual needs of the patient and they're done so based on the doctor's orders. So customizing the strength or dosage, uh, sometimes they'll flavor them. Um, we can change the dosages, we can change the forms, we can do sublingual, we can do creams, we can do vaginal, and even in some crazy cases, there's people out there doing rectal, which I personally have no idea why, but they do that. Um, how is it that compounding is different from drug manufacturing? Well, traditional compounding is the prep preparation of the medication to the exact specification. So let's take, for instance, some. Um, Micronized progesterone, that one's been around forever. There's two doses that you can get from uh, manufacturers, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams. But let's say 100 is too much and 200 is not enough, or the other way around. 100 isn't enough, 200 is too much. And you want to try 125 or 150. Can't do that on the regular marketplace because when that company went to the FDA, they only went with two doses because it takes a lot of money to get those approved. So they didn't want to do more. But a compounding pharmacy can do 125. They can do 150, 175. They can do it however we want. So compounding would take the same medication and just maybe change the dosages or the route of delivery. Again, licensed pharmacists, same training, education, maybe even a little bit more training because they have to... Um, they have to uh, learn how to compound and things like that. And, you know, actually there are some mainstream um, companies now that are doing this. Uh, companies like, for instance, HEB, which is a big um, chain out here of uh, grocery stores. They are actually um, doing this now. They're making their compounding. So they're getting into the business. I prefer to use local companies because I just like the idea of using something local and I want to support those folks and I also want to have a relationship with those folks and they've been doing it longer so I just feel like they're probably better at it. So when you're thinking about compounding pharmacies, as I said, they're not FDA approved. So who regulates them? Who regulates these pharmacies? Now keep in mind, most compounding pharmacies will also do regular prescriptions. So if I call in a blood pressure medication or pain meds after a surgery, you can get those at a compounding pharmacy, and usually they will um, use your insurance for that. Um, 
So the actual pharmacists that are engaged in compounding are expected to follow standards and guidelines and regulations that are put out by the FDA. They still have to do oversight and things like that. Uh, the DEA has oversight for any controlled substances, especially in this case, testosterone. So we still have to abide by the rules. Like me as a provider, I have to be licensed in that state to provide testosterone. Um, the pharmacy also needs to be in that state to ship testosterone. Like you have, you, you can't ship testosterone across state lines unless the, the pharmacy is licensed in that state. So. They're basically, um, uh, there's an organization called the United States Pharmacopeia Convention, and this place issues the standards for these compounding pro par pharmacies. Um, it's a private nonprofit group, um, defines the chemical purity of the drug, also issues standards for the drugs. The USP, um, you always hear that, you know, the USP standard, that's the United States Pharmacopeia. Uh, they develop the standards for the identity, quality, strength, and purity. Um, sometimes they also will look at supplements and food ingredients and things like that. So these pharmacies then usually get accredited for the Accreditation Council for Healthcare. Um, they can either do sterile or non-sterile. Sterile preps mean those are usually the pharmacies that make like injectables, like um, men who get injectable testosterone, um, things of that nature. So sterilization, pellets, injections, which I hate both. Um, have to be made at a compounding pharmacy that has the potential to do sterile procedures. Um, so we know they have special training. Um, is compounding necessary? That's an interesting question because the simple answer would be no. Um, we have um, medications available through uh, regular means. We don't have testosterone though, unless you wanna give a woman um, something like uh, androgel, which is a male dose, and then tell her she has to take this little packet of testosterone and get one-tenth of it and put it on her skin. There's absolutely no way to do that because it's so runny and gross that it's almost impossible to do. Um, so then you're going to see negativity online about compounding pharmacies and what they do. And this usually comes from the bigger uh, pharmaceutical organizations because think about it. For hormones, especially, the compounding pharmacies cut hugely into their profit margins, and they just don't like them. Um, and on the flip side of that, you do have some compounding pharmacies that will or used to make false claims. They'll say things about their estrogen product. This happened about 20 years ago with um, Triest and Biest. They would make false claims about the estriol component of the uh, ingredient. And they would say that it could cure or prevent breast cancer. That's never been proven. And so what then happens is they get put in the crosshairs of the FDA and the DEA, and they get shut down. And this has happened on many, and they're doing that right now for compounded semaglutide and terzeptide because the compounding pharmacy will use the same dosage as Eli Lilly's terzeptide Monjaro. And so if Eli Lilly finds out about it, they'll send the FDA in to shut them down. So they have to be a little bit careful. There have also been some, men in, there was a huge meningitis outbreak. Um, in 2012, patients developed fungal meningitis after receiving injections into the spinal cord that were made by a company called the New England Compounding Center. And these were steroids that were being injected into people's backs, and there were people that died. And the reason for that was there were some things that went wrong. Um, the compounded preparation was a suspension, had visible, visible particles in it, um, wasn't made appropriately. Um, the pharmacy was cutting corners. Now, keep in mind, these are sterile injections. The compounding pharmacies that make topical creams, those aren't sterilized because um, they don't need to be. They're done under sterile conditions, but they don't have to be sterilized because they're not being injected into your body. So compounded hormones are the same hormones that you would find at mainstream pharmacies. But the compounded hormones are made in a compounding pharmacy. So think about you have Pharmacy A and Pharmacy B. Pharmacy A has contracts with Eli Lilly, Pfizer, um, you know, the, the big manufacturers, Bayer, 
And so they use the products that those companies supply and they make money because they turn around and up, up, up price the product. So let's say they buy it for $10, they sell it for $200. A compounded hormone is the same hormone that CVS has negotiated with the um, Pfizer on, only the compounding pharmacist will, will get the prescription, say for two milligrams of estradiol in a cream, they'll take the powder that they buy from the same place that these big organizations buy from. They'll mix it into a cream. They'll standardize it. They'll measure it. They'll do all the things they have to do. They'll put it into a little container with a dial. Now, is it as an exact science? Is it more open to human mistakes? Of course it is. Of course it is. There's absolutely no question in my mind. It's being made by a person. So there's always risk for that. I have been doing this now for probably 25 years, and I have seen maybe two medication errors out of 50,000 women. Uh, the chances of a medication error. I've had more medication errors at a big pharmacy giving a patient the wrong medication. So um, it happens, but it happens everywhere. It happens no matter what, you know, what pharmacy you go to. Human error is always something that you need to think about. So ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, in November of 2023, not too long ago, came out with a clinical consensus, if you will on compounded bioidentical menopausal hormone therapy. Notice the wording, menopausal. They don't even talk about perimenopause, just menopause. Um, the Committee on Clinical Consensus Gynecology was developed by the American College of OBGYN and Clinical Consensus Gynecology in collaboration with Amy Park and Belinda Yager. And I'm curious as to how, if they have any affiliations. I can't really say, but... I can look at the conflict of interest, and they submitted um, that uh, they don't have any. So I will believe that because that's what they said. So the committee consensus has a summary, and it's, it says such. I'm reading this verbatim. Many compounding pharmacies use the phrase bioidentical hormone as a marketing term to imply that these preparations are natural and thus safer. Now. They're putting a lot of words into the mouths of the compounding pharmacy. First of all, the way that they word this, that they're using bioidentical as a marketing term. This is fascinating because it is bioidentical. It looks like the biological hormone, bioidentical. What's funny is NAMS, the North American Menopause Society, now the Menopause Society, I did an episode on this. They didn't like that. They didn't like that the compounding pharmacies had their own word. So they changed bioidentical to body identical <laughs> because you know doctors are assholes and we have to have our own words for everything and we have to try to take everything over so god forbid we use bioidentical but apparently body identical is okay but not bioidentical then they say um that that it's implied that they're implying now who's implying this i said years ago there might have been a couple of rogue pharmacies that did say stuff like this but that's not what happens on a large scale this this is rogue pharmacists that are trying to generate business saying this 99.9 percent .9 of the compounding pharmacists are on the up and up they value their licenses they're good people and so to put this in there is very incendiary and it tells you right from the beginning where they're coming from then they go on. However, evidence to support marketing claims of safety and effectiveness is lacking. Again, bashing them. Compounded bioidentical menopause hormone therapy should not be prescribed routinely when FDA approved formulations exist. Let's interpret that. Bioidentical hormone therapy should not be prescribed routinely when there are companies that have paid a lot of money to the FDA to have their products on the market. And some of these companies are paying us, so we're going to back them. That's exactly what this is. This is just a chain of command telling you that you're stepping outside of the status quo and that there's a lot of money invested in this and they want you to use these products. Um, that's all that means. If a patient requests the use of compounded bioidentical hormone therapy, clinicians should educate them on the lack of FDA approval. So basically, if the patient comes in, we should gaslight them. Oh, my God. My colleagues just piss me off to no end. If a patient requests the use of compounded bioidentical menopausal hormone therapy, clinicians should first 
I put the first in there, but they should educate them on a lack of FDA approval of these preparations and their potential risks and benefits, including the risks specific to compounding. Okay. So these are the same bioidentical hormones that are used in, mar in manufactured forms, but yet we have to tell the patients that ask about compounded that they don't have FDA approval. Again, that's a little bit of a word salad because the hormones themselves are indeed FDA approved. What's not FDA approved is the preparation that's done in the compounding pharmacy. So the FDA here is fudging. ACOG is fudging. They are trying to scare you. I think it's really disgusting, personally, that they're using this scare tactic to push you away from, and they do it in this word salad. Um, so if the patient requests, we should gaslight them, and we should tell you how horrible they are, and we should tell you how horrible compounding is, which would be fine if these guys weren't receiving millions and millions of dollars from big pharmacy. To truly understand the benefits and harms of compounded bioidentical hormone therapy, high-quality, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trials with long-term follow-up should be done with FDA approval. Now, how many times has the FDA been shown to fuck things up? Vioxx. Look up Vioxx, V-I-O-X-X. How many people died from Viox from heart disease, and that was FDA approved. They had to pull it from the market. How many drugs, how many medical um, devices were FDA approved with the sleight of hand from false studies because the company doing the, the research on the product is the company that invested millions in the product? Do you not think that those companies are financially benefited by this product doing well? right? So they're not going to do a study, the study that FDA and ACOG is telling you to support, that's done by the company that made the product. Do you think for a minute, if they spent $20 million on an estradiol patch, getting it through the FDA, do you think for a second that they would say that it was bad for you and scuttle it? Come on, man. I'm not stupid. And so what they're saying, though, is to truly understand the benefits and harms of compounded bioidentical hormones. It's the same goddamn hormones that we're getting manufactured, but they use the word compound. So anyways, their statement is very obvious, and they summarize things here by saying, there's a lack of high-quality data on the safety and efficacy of custom compounded. So it's true, because compounded Hormones are made at thousands of compounding pharmacies in the country. They're the exact same hormones, though, that we use on a daily basis. Um, there's no FDA-approved testosterone formulation for the management of menopausal symptoms, which is laughable and a fucking joke. Clinicians and patients should use a shared decision-making framework when considering the use. But they just said in the previous paragraph that we should tell you how horrible these are, but then we're supposed to use a shared decision-making framework. So we're supposed to gaslight you and scare you and then come up with a shared decision process. Based on the lack of safety data and the inability to remove the pellet, ACOG recommends, okay, I, pellets I agree with, but they literally gave testosterone about two sentences and basically just said there's no FDA-approved testosterone formation formulation for the management of menopausal symptoms. And their next sentence should be, and that's a goddamn shame. But instead, we've got 10 for men and none for women. Then they go in to add the accuracy of hormone level testing. Data on the interpretation of adjunct hormone tests for prescribing and dosing compounded bioidentical hormone therapy are limited and thus these tests are not recommended. Okay, so when these companies, when say Pfizer, Bayer, Eli Lilly, when they go to the FDA for a medication, they have to have a dosage, right? How did they come up with the dosage? They did studies, right? So they, they did studies to find out that 
one milligram does this, two milligrams does that. This is the dose you probably need to protect bones, you know, things like that. So they, they dumped a bunch of money in that. But this is saying that compounded bioidentical hormone therapy is limited because, again, they don't have the millions of dollars to put into the testing, but the hormones are the same. So wouldn't it make sense that if I used a similar dose, that it would give you similar levels? And thank you, you've spent all the money on the research. We're just piggybacking off of that. Well, they hate that. And so that's why they don't want you to use it because these companies obviously spent a lot of money on that. And so they don't want you to do that. So um, basically, again, they, they try to drive home this aspect is that there is a lack of high quality data on the safety and effic efficacy of custom compounded bioidentical hormone therapy. Compounded bioidentical hormone menopausal management should not be prescribed routinely because there are FDA approved formulas. But the FDA also has a proviso. This is exactly what's happened with Monjaro. So Monjaro, which is the injectable um, GLP-1, terzepatide, was on the scarcity list. Now there is a law that says when a medication is in scarce resource or scarce supply, patients can't get it. Compounding pharmacies can pick up the slack and can make it. If it's okay to do it in an emergency, why can't we just do it all the time with the support? Why is it okay and safe if the big companies run out of the product? See, this is the thing. This is how you know this is complete garbage because they, they, they shoot themselves in the foot. I just, this makes absolutely no sense to me. The fact that they're, you know, harping on this, um, look. You should make this decision for yourself. I always give patients the options. You can do a patch, you can do micronized progesterone, you can get them both at CVS. If you want testosterone because you feel like it would help you, here are some of the symptoms of low testosterone. Does it make sense to put them on estradiol patch, progesterone capsule, testosterone cream? That's three separate prescriptions. Well, if I can put the estrogen in with the testosterone and save you some money, why wouldn't we do that? So I do counsel the patients, and you should have options. These doctors that you go to that only tell you they only do pellets, what they're saying to you is they are money grubbers and they only do pellets because it makes them a shit ton of money. The fact that they would do a pellet but not do any other form of, of uh, that's manipulation. That is gaslighting. That is horrifying and unethical, and you should run away from those providers as fast as you can. Now, it talks about the U.S. FDA approved bioidentical hormone ther therapies. Here we go. For estradiol, there are oral tablets. You can get them in 0.5, 1.0, 2.0 milligrams. There are transdermal preparations like patches and gels, emulsions and sprays. There's also a vaginal ring available. Progesterone. There is oral micronized progesterone, vaginal progesterone, and a vaginal progesterone insert. For combination therapies, there is an oral estradiol and a micronized progesterone pill that you can take. And then um, testosterone, the only ones available are the, the gels that are in male doses and DHEA. There is a vaginal insert called Intrarosa, although you can get DHEA anywhere. anywhere. Um, my, my take it is, is, it, is this. What's happening with bioidentical hormone therapy is they're cutting into the profit margins of the big pharmacies. Whenever you do that, you're going to be in the crosshairs. These are the same hormones that are used when drugs are manufactured in big com companies. Same stuff. They buy it from the same place. They source it from the same place. It comes from cactus, wild yam, and soy. They make it, and then they put it into a patch, a gel, a cream, a pill. When a compounding pharmacy does it, they use the same stuff. It's just made in smaller batches, and it's made per my request. So let's say um, you have an oral capsule that's available for progesterone, like I said, 100, 200 milligrams. That's all you can get at CVS or Walgreens. But I want to use 150 milligrams. Well, you'd be shit out of luck if there wasn't a compounding pharmacy. Now, if it's the same stuff and they just didn't trademark the 150 milligram dose. Why is it that you shouldn't be given that as an option when it might be the perfect dose for you? 
And that's really the way that I look at these hormones. You, you need to make that decision for yourself. You need to arm yourself with all the possibilities. And we need to look at prices. Maybe it's cheaper to use CVS and Walgreens because your insurance pays for it. Sometimes it's like five bucks. Okay, well, let's do that. Doctors should never just give you one option. That, that's wrong. Um, I do probably say in my practice, 90% of the patients are probably on compounded because they like the idea of putting everything together. It's easier to dose for them. They don't have to think about this, that, and the other thing. They can just use one thing. Um, it's about because we know that compliance goes up the less that you have to do. So that's, that's why I do that. But I also give other options. So I hope this clears the water a little bit about the differences between compounded and bioidentical and manufactured versus compounded. Um, as always, if you want to go deeper, if you like my content, go to thehormoneproject.com, become a member. There's lots of bonuses. Um, from permanent discounts and supplements. If you buy a lot of supplements monthly, you'll get 20% off. That might pay for the monthly membership in and of itself. You'll get a discount if you ever want to come see me. I do lives once a month just for the people. We have a Facebook page where you can ask questions. It's more for you to get more time with me, and it gives me the ability to focus on the people that really want more information. So head to thehormoneproject.com and check it out. As always, Hope you all have a great week, a good weekend coming up, and I'll talk to you on the other side.